Uh, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Uh, it's the last book in your Bibles. Uh, the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 28. I, I, this is my second message on the journey to the prophetic. Last week, I spoke to you about God taking a people out of the land of Egypt and then going through the desert. And what ended up producing in them, the end result of that, was that they came out of Egypt with a very hard heart. Pharaoh had done a number on them. In fact, Exodus 1 says that they were bitter. And, and you can read the story, but here's what happens. The, the desert ends up producing in them something that, that's pretty rare to them, and that they became sarcastic. They, they, they ended up seeing God's miracles and they got accustomed to things, and, and every time they get into a difficulty, uh, they would start complaining. Now, they would do that. You would never do that. But ended up being that God, you know, saw the, the hard heart and the sarcasm, and uh, God said to them, but before they come into the promised land, Canaan, he says, I need to do circumcision in your hearts. Why? Because where I'm taking you, you cannot see the new land with the perspective and the attitudes of the past. So I'm going to circumcise your hearts. I'm going to do a work in you. And then he says, do not say this is too far from you. From you. But, but the word is very near to you. And I'm setting life and death. And so he takes them into a journey. And he, he provides the land of Canaan. Some experienced the new, the prophetic. Ten didn't. Out of the 12 spies, you know, they ended up saying, the land is beautiful. But boy, the giants are just, it's too big for me. They, they did not understand the new because the, the past had done a number in them. Now think about you and me because we go through the same experiences. In fact, this is written... The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 15, it is written for our instruction. Yes. So would you say you and I can learn something out of this? Yes. Now, today I want to speak to you about in the journey into the prophetic, how do you manage a promise in a time of crisis? How many of you have ever had a crisis? Yeah. All right, two of you. And in that crisis, God makes some promises. And in and, and the crisis, you, you don't hear the promise. You hear the crisis. Let me just tell you how it works in church. You come to the front. You're going through something. Someone prays for you, reads your mail, starts prophesying, and you say, Thank God you have heard me. You go right back and there's a crisis in front of you. All of a sudden, you forget the promise because the crisis speaks louder than the promise. Does that make sense? Yes. This man is in a crisis. He is running away with fear. Fear is chasing him. Amazingly enough, fear gets the best of him. Go to chapter 28, and, and I want you to recognize this. Because he has an encounter with God, he doesn't even recognize the encounter because of the crisis. He has run away from home, fearing his life because Esau is out to get him. Now, why is this important? Because God is going to take him on a journey where he's going to have to learn to manage the seasons of manifestation. And listen to this. And the seasons of hiddenness. I enjoy the seasons of manifestation. I would love to live on manifestation 24-7. Encounter to encounter to encounter. How many of you know that sometimes that's just exciting? 
In fact, you know, Angie just, she left me for a week, abandoned me. But while she was in Michigan visiting her, her family, uh, her sister, one of her sisters, gave her this little bottle of oil. And uh, this preacher, I don't know who he is, is, is living in a season of manifestation. He, he goes and, and he puts his Bible, starts preaching, and suddenly oil starts flowing out of that pulpit. And so they're smart. They, they, they're starting to catch the oil. And so Angie brought a little glass, whatever you want to call it, of oil. Now, I promise you, I'm not selling snake oil here. <laughs> but she said, Fernando, I brought this because I want to pray for you. And I said, let's do it. So, interestingly enough, uh, yesterday I, I did some training and, and I, I was hurting. My mind says one thing, my body says a different thing. How many of you know that happens sometimes? My mind says you're still 25. My body says, no, you're 30. <laughs> Why are you laughing so hard? That's not fair. So Angie goes and starts praying for me, takes the oil, and, and I'm telling you, immediately the pain left me. I don't have enough oil for everybody. So later on the afternoon, uh, we went out to eat, and she says, what's hurting? <laughs> I said, here. She said, okay, I'm going to lay hands on you, and I'm going to rub some of that oil. You know what? It worked. Listen, I would love to be the preacher whose Bible is dripping oil, but right now it's pretty dry. And for the most part, I would encourage you to enjoy the seasons of manifestation. They are amazing. This dude is in such crisis that he ignores the season of manifestation. Look what he says. Genesis chapter 28. Because of the crisis, he's not able to manage the words he's hearing. Look with me, if you would, verse 16 and 17. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep. And said, surely, the Lord is in this house, in this place. I didn't even know it. I was afraid, and I said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Think about this. He just had a dream. He took a rock, lay on it, did not have tempur at the time, pillows, but, but God visits him all night long, and the Bible says he saw angels ascending and descending. He saw a ladder. He calls this the gate of heaven. Wakes up and says, maybe this was God. Yeah. What caused him not to see this? It was the crisis he was facing. And I'm saying this to you to encourage you that sometimes you and I may be facing a crisis, a diagnosis, a financial situation, maybe a family situation that prevents us from seeing the encounter with God. And sometimes the crisis supersedes the promise. And what I hope to do this morning is just to show you how to manage the crisis and the promise so that we move into the encounter. So here's what happens. God speaks to him, and I want you to look with me at verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I'm going to give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you, all your descendants will be all the families of the earth and will be blessed. Verse 15. This is what I want you to pay attention. And behold, I am with you. 
I'm going to keep you wherever you go. I'm going to bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God speaks to him in the encounter. And he says, I'm going to bring you back into this land. You're getting ready to go on a journey. You don't know about the journey. But I'm promising you that I will fulfill what I'm speaking to you. The only problem is that first dude he meets is Laban. After he receives a promise, the first person he meets is Laban. And he ends up falling in love with one of Laban's daughters, Rachel. And so Laban says, look, Jacob, smart dude, says, look, I, I want to marry your daughter. What does it take? He says, serve me seven years. So Jacob serves him seven years. Chapter 29 and 30 says that the seven years were to him as one day because he loved Rachel. And so he, he goes to the day when he's going to get married and he goes into his tent Wakes up in the morning, and instead of Rachel, he gets Leah. And, and, and Jacob says, wait a minute, you have deceived me. The negotiator comes out and says, look, Laban says, look, I know you want a Rachel. How about you serve me another seven years for Leah, and I'll give you both Rachel and Leah. I mean, think about this. You've just fled your house because of fear. You've had an encounter and getting ready to face this dude. 14 years he serves him. 14 for, for what a promise. How many of you have ever thought you're getting Rachel and, and instead you get Leah? Do you know what I'm talking about? And you feel cheated because you felt this is what I felt God was saying to you. How many of you have missed it at least once in a lifetime? Maybe, maybe, just a little bit. He did. And then after the 14 years, he wants to leave. You know who comes out? The negotiator. And he says, look... We're not ready for you to leave. You are a blessing to me. How can you leave me? That would not be right, Jacob. I, I love this story. I mean, it's, it's kind of harsh. But he ends up spending 20 years with Laban. To me, that's a long time. Now remember, he's either going to focus on the journey or he's going to focus on the promise. After the 14 years, I want you to think about this. Let's, let's put it in your language. He comes to Laban and says, Laban, you have changed my wages 10 times. Now, would you not feel cheated if you've served seven years for something that ended up being something different, then you serve another seven years, and during that time, your wages have changed? So let's present it to you this way. What if your job is paying you 100000 this year, but your boss comes to you, listen, Sean, the economy is bad. We as a company love you, so we want you to take a pay cut until we get better. We're cutting you to 50. The team player says, of course. The year comes... And he goes back to Laban, probably says, hey, where is my other 50? I'm going to leave. And, and Laban's smart. Laban says, wait a minute. Let me give you 75 this year. And, and then when things get better, I'll, I'll, I'll fix, I'll make it up to you. So you take one for the team. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
Can you imagine going through 10 times this thing? You know what most of us would have done? Hasta la vista. Wouldn't you? Oh, come on. You're going to be like Jacob? Jacob stayed. Jacob knew he was on a journey. And in this journey, he goes for a season of 20 years of hiddenness. What is hiddenness? It's the season when God or you feel like he is not with you. You have all these promises, but they're not being fulfilled. How many of you have a prophetic word that has not yet taken place? And in that prophetic word, you feel like, God, where are you? you I, I thought this was it. Jacob is embarking on a journey of 20 years that is going to produce in him a supernatural ability to not only encounter the supernatural and be part of the future, but is going to strengthen him inside. What you don't realize is that sometimes God allows these seasons to build you up on the inside. And, and let's just face it. Most of us, I'll say that for me, I, I would rather live on encounter to encounter and manifestation to manifestation. Unless you understand the, the seasons of hiddenness, you won't understand what you're going through. But you know what? Go, go with me to chapter 30. I, I want to encourage you with this because something happened with Jacob. I, I don't know what started producing in him, but this is the most amazing part. Jacob starts feeling unsettled. There is a discontent in his heart that's producing something in him. So he goes to the master negotiator, Laban. <laughs> Look at this. Poor guy. Chapter 30, verse 25. Because what you think it's a bad thing is really not. It's a new season. Verse 25, chapter 30, verse 25. It came about when Rachel had born Joseph, oh, Joseph, the son that sees. Jacob said to, to, to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place, my own country. Give me my wives, my children from whom have I served you. Let me depart for you yourself. Know my service, which I've rendered to you. But Laban, oh, watch this. Laban said, hey, I now, if now it pleases you, stay with me. What would you do? Stay with me. I'll be sweet to you. I'll love you. Read it. I mean, this is like amazing. If now it pleases you, stay with me. I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. And when he continue, and as he continue, name me your wages and I'm going to give them to you. Just name your price. What do you want? I'll give you 150. You know what? Laban the negotiator is getting ready to be out-negotiated. Because Jacob has learned something in the season of hiddenness. Amen. And what I'm saying to you, don't just disregard the season you are in. Because God's building something in you that will produce wisdom and power for the future. You see, most of us are into the now. Two of us, okay. The rest of you are into the future. I'm into the God you promised me, put it in the microwave and let me have it. No? That's me, not you. But watch this. Verse 29. But he said to him, this is Jacob, you yourself know that I have served you and how your cattle has fared with me. I love this part because this discontent that's in him has produced something. He wants to go home. He wants to go back to Bethel. He wants to go where everything started. 
The New Testament paints the color this way to the church of Ephesus. You have left your first love. Come back. Come back. You, you know, uh, my wife and I were watching a, a program yesterday, and in and, and the commercials, all these, because uh, we don't watch a lot of the, the, the shows, uh, they're showing all these movies on the supernatural and, and witchcraft and I won't even name them, but it's horrible. But, but she said, what is going on? I, I, this is my personal opinion, and I think I'm right. So if you choose to be wrong, that's fine. <laughs> I said to her, I believe that people are hungry for the supernatural. They're looking in all the wrong places. They're looking into the media, the mountain of media, and I think this is the season for the church to rise up and start releasing the supernatural on the face of the earth. I really do. I don't think this is a season for you to get stressed and say, God, it's, it, we're just going to be over. No, 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 no. I've read somewhere in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 20, that the light of the righteous gets brighter and brighter and brighter till the, light, till the day of dawn. The kingdom of God, I read somewhere in Daniel 7 that the kingdom of God is increasing and ever increasing. I read somewhere in, in, in Revelation 16 that the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our God. So the negotiator is getting ready to be out negotiated. Watch this, because in this particular season, Jacob has learned the language of the prophetic. I love the way he learned. Watch the, uh, what he says. Okay, here's the deal, uh, Laban. I'm going to stay with you, verse 32. But here's the deal, what we're doing with our flocks. Verse 32, let me pass through your entire flock today, removing from there every speckle and spotted sheep, Every black one among the lambs, the spotted, the speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. So my honesty will answer for me later when you come concerning your, my wages. Everyone that is not speckled, spotted, and black among the lambs, if it's found with me, will be considered stolen. Here's what he does. It, it, uh, when you first read this, it looks like this is, what are you doing? Let me tell you what he's doing. He's taking the worst of all the sheep and the goats. The speckle, if you read from the Middle Eastern culture, the speckle, the black, they were worthless. They, they, in fact, black was not even a good thing to have. Because if you shear the sheep, if it's white, you can stain it any way you want to. But if you have black, well, you're kind of stuck with black, right? Here's what, what Jacob has done. He has learned the language of the prophetic. And let me tell you why this is important for you to think about. Because he takes the worst sheep in the flock. Because these sheep are a symbol of hardship and mourning. If you read anything about black in the Old Testament, they always represent mourning and hardship. And Jacob has learned, because of the desire of going and wanting to go back to Bethel, that God can turn all the mourning into dancing, all the sorrow into joy. God will turn my sorrows into victories. And what starts as a feeble flock will end up being an army of sheep and goats that are stronger than Laban's. And God will use what he, Laban, anybody, one of us would call, you've gone through misery. God is going to turn it around and turn it into an opportunity for wealth in Jacob's life. You see, the world looks at us and says, you're crazy. God says, I will turn all your ashes into victory. 
I will turn all the days of mourning and hardship into joy. Amen. Not only has he learned that God can take the worst and make it into something good, watch what he does. He has learned the language of the prophetic. Number two, look at verse 36. And so he talks to Laban and says, look, go away. You take your flock, I'll take mine, and let's, let's do this. Verse 36, and he put a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of, the, of Laban's flock. He now has learned the language of the kingdom. Somewhere there in the New Testament, the three days, the Friday starts as a day of pain and sorrow. By Saturday, the promise looks like it's dead. Oh, but on Sunday, on the third day, all the pain and the sorrow has turned into resurrection and redemption. This is pointing to Christ. I want you to think about it. He not only takes the worst, because God can turn it into something. He learns the language of the prophetic and distanced himself three days. But look at this. This is going to sound crazy to you. And it is if you read it from the natural eyes. Here's the third thing that, that Jacob does. I love this because it makes absolutely no sense. Verse 37, then Jacob took, took fresh rods. Rods are always a picture of what? Authority. And almond, uh, almond plane trees. And peel them white stripes, exposing the white which was in the rods. So here's what he does. He takes almond branches and starts peeling them. Now think about it. In the natural, this looks absolutely crazy, right? So he starts making boundaries and puts all the almond branches here. And all the sheep that are going to go get water go through these tunnels of, of almond branches. What in the world does that have to do with anything? Jacob knows that the almond tree is the only tree in one of the fewest of all the trees. In fact, the almond tree is called the wakeful tree. This tree wakes up before all the other trees in the forest after winter. And what God is saying, are you awake to see what I'm about to do? And Jacob knows that. So he takes what you and I would call a crazy thing, takes the almond branches, and sure enough, every one of his sheep starts drinking water through those channels, and when they mate, they have to go through these channels. I love this story because he uses the almond to reference the future. He is now aware of the supernatural. He's taking the worst, because God can make something out of it. He's, the, he's distanced himself three days because he knows that there's resurrection on the third day. Yeah. Now he puts almond branches because he's awake to what God is getting ready to do with him. I love this story. Look at verse 41. Moreover, it came about whenever the stronger of the flock were mating, that Jacob would place rods in the sight of all the flocks in the gutters, so that they might mate by the rods. But when the flock was feeble, he did not put him in so, in. so the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. Watch this. So the man became exceedingly prosperous, had large flocks, female, male servants, camels, and donkeys. Let me tell you. All the prosperity that Laban stole from him just came back to him. 
God has taken the dark side, the three days, the almond branches, and said, all your sorrow has now turned into dancing. I think that's a big amen and a shout to what you're facing. Because he's been facing a crisis for 20-some years. That is a long time. I'm like, Lord, I, I, how many of you have ever said this? Maybe it's just me. I said, Lord, I really don't have 20 years. I really need it like yesterday. Has that ever come across through your register? No? I tell you what, you are a blessed people. Go to chapter 35. This is amazing. Uh, in fact, no, go, go, stay there. Sorry, my apologies. Let me tell you what happens. By now, Laban comes back. He is upset. Because his sons have told him, listen, Jacob's flock is strong. He's a wealthy man, and you are broke, Dad. You need to go do something. So Laban goes back and says, what have you done? You know what Jacob says? I love this language. You ought to read the whole chapter. I don't have time to do that. But Jacob says, hey, I just did what we agreed on. Did you not give me your word? And Laban says, surely, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but that night, watch this. That night, God gave Laban a dream. And in the dream, God said to Laban, Laban, you must be careful how you speak to Jacob. He's my Jacob now. He's gone through the journey of hiddenness. I love this because look at verse 11 of chapter 31. Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. Remember the first time in Bethel? He said, what is this? It, oh, this got to be the house of God. Not this time. He just has a dream, sees an angel, and he says, hey, I'm here. I'm ready for manifestation. I'm ready to enter into an encounter with your presence. I need a miracle. This guy's been ripping me off for 20 years. I need to go home. I love God. Because God has never forgotten his promise. You may think he does. Your delays, your crisis, your diagnosis, your financial status, your family situation, your kid situation. You may think it's, God has totally forgotten about this. He hasn't. Look at verse 12. And he said, this is the angel speaking to Jacob, lift up now. Your eyes and see that the male goats which are mating are stripped, speckled, molted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. Verse 13. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Arise, leave this land and return to the land of your birth. What just happened? Jacob has learned the seasons of manifestation and the seasons of hiddenness. Jacob has learned the language of the prophetic and now has come into agreement with the promise instead of the journey. I will tell you, that if Laban changed my wages ten times, I would maybe last one time, maybe two times. You know what happens? It's a picture of what we all go through. Ever been through a difficult season? And, and you think, well, if I do this, let's say it the way we think. The grass looks greener on the other side. You know the problem is? When you get to the other side, there you are. Your mindset hasn't changed. 
And, and listen, I, I, I will tell you a personal story I said in, in first service. Uh, I think it was some years ago, maybe uh, 19 years ago. How can I remember all this? I may need to go to so-so, get some freedom here. I, I was in a very difficult situation. It was a, ser- a horrible crisis. Some of you were with me at the time. And uh, you know what? I thought, Lord, this is a perfect opportunity for me to do something, grow my business, go do something else, go into the marketplace. I can be a better witness there than I can. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the details. So, I got an offer that was tendered to me in writing with a huge sign-up bonus. And so, I thought, Lord, praise God, this is you. I'm just being honest with you. You may think this is crazy, but it was a six-figure uh, at that time. It was 150, and I thought, that's, I'll take it. I mean, but I, I'm, I'm in covenant with my wife, so I went to Angie. I still remember as if it was yesterday. I went upstairs, and I said, Angie, this company is hustling me, and they've offered me this much, and it's, this is just the sign-up bonus, and, and I'm telling you, this is a great deal. Uh, you know what? I, I turn on my spiritual Bible quoting. I'm telling you, I was ready. I could quote you all the scriptures I needed to. And I remember, she was, we had at the time, all our bedrooms were on the upstairs, and she was folding clothes in the bathroom. I'm going to anoint you with oil when we get home. <laughs> and, and she's folding clothes, and I said, Angie, this just came, and, and I'm telling you, this has been a hard season for us. You know, I'm t- trying to play the poor little sheep, the poor me. You've got to listen to me because I want to do my own thing. And so I said, look, this is what's offered to me, and we could do so much better. We would do this. We would do that. I would take care of you. I would just do this. And, and she kept folding clothes. I remember them towels. <laughs> Lord have mercy. She had white baskets. So I'm going to tell you, I probably need so-so. Uh, there, she had these white baskets, and she's folding them red, green, and I'm like, I still remember them. And she turns around, and she said, Um, I don't think that's God's will, and you know that for sure, and I don't, you may get, you you do whatever you want, I'll go with you, but I don't think that's God's will, and I don't think God's going to bless it, and I'm like, woman, (laughs) you know what, I wanted to do my own thing, thank God for people that love you and that are honest. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know what? Sometimes the best thing you need is someone to be honest with you. So she kind of blew my bubble, (laughs) depressed me, and said, go back to what God has called you to do. No. Would you let me finish? So I did. I went back to to what God called me to do. Here's what happened. Six months later, the company went bankrupt. And I'm telling you, sometimes what you think is God teasing you is God protecting you. Sometimes you so focus on the crisis that you forget the promise. The amazing story goes this way. Go to chapter 35. Uh, I love this story, and and then after that, I'm going to have you go to Hebrews. But this is what God does. Thirty years have now taken place. How many of you know that 30 years is a long time? I will enter into agreement with you. 30 years is a long time. I'm like, I need it yesterday, Lord. 30 years have gone by. Now God speaks to him. Verse 1. God said to Jacob, arise, go to Bethel, live there, make your altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. 
Look at verse 7. And he built an altar there, called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Look what he does. He now has the blessing of God to go back. He's a smart man. He has developed wisdom. He has developed insight. He has developed an eye for the supernatural. Because what he does, Bethel means what? The house of God. But El Bethel means the God of the house. He goes back and says, after all these years, I realized I met the house of God. But now I know the God of the house. And he will bring me into the fullness of my destiny. Go to chapter 11 of Hebrews. And this is one of the most amazing stories. Because all this time, God was preparing Jacob to prophesy into the future. And sometimes we live for our today and forget that we are to prophesy into the future. And not allow the crisis to erase the promise. Chapter 11 of Hebrews says it this way, verse 20. All the patriarchs had this eye. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, watch this, even regarding the things that were to come. If they were to come, would you agree that they were in the future? Isaac was able to prophesy to Jacob and Esau concerning the future. Now, a, a Jacob is now going to be challenged to do the same. Look at verse 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed the sons of Joseph and worshiped. How? Leaning on the top of his staff. Watch what happens. You can read this in, in Genesis 49. Jacob by now has 12 sons. Eight by Leah and the rest by, J by, by uh, Rachel. But he's got a son whose name is Joseph, which means a son that sees. He's got a Benjamin that means son of my right hand. So now he has the power to see and he has the power to implement. What does he do? He takes his staff, sits down, and starts praying, prophesying destiny into each one of the sons. You can read it in Genesis 49 and to Reuben, my firstborn. You can read Levi. You can read all of them. What was he doing? He was preparing the 12 sons to become the 12 tribes. Because the 12 tribes would become a nation. A nation from which a Messiah would come. A Messiah that would end up rescuing you and me so that we can prophesy into the future and say, God, I will take the season of crisis and lean back into the promise and prophesy into the future. So regardless of what your diagnosis is, your crisis, your difficulty today, you must stand and say, God, I am going to prophesy into the future. I'm not going to do my own thing in times of season and hiddenness. Because listen, all of us at some point in time, well, maybe just me, I've done my own thing because I thought, well, God just, God's not doing his stuff. So I'm going to go do my stuff. I know you don't think that way, but I do sometimes, especially in my earlier years. I've learned that those are the seasons of uh, hiddenness that I have to lean on the promise, not the crisis. Would you stand with me? Because if you learn the language of the prophetic, you can let God give you the worst because he will turn it into a blessing. You need to learn the law of the three day because what starts as trouble, what looks like death, 
ends up in resurrection. Amen? Amen. And watch this. The third part, which is the most amazing thing, God will take all of this stuff. I don't know how he does it. But you will end up prophesying life into the next generation. And I don't know about you. You may think this world is falling apart. And it is in your eyes and in my eyes. But in the eyes of God, you know what he's saying? I want seasons of manifestation. I want my people to rise up. Awake from their sleep. And go shake this world. Because the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our God. And I'm telling you, you need to, if you have kids, little ones, you start grabbing them, anointing them with oil, pray over them. I, I told you what I do with my grandkids. Well, they're getting a little too heavy for me now to carry both of them at the same time. I, I pray in the spirit over their ears. And I love it. When they were younger, they would always go like this. You know what I was doing? I'm saying, God, develop an ear in these boys for the supernatural, for your voice. So listen, if I can do that for a boy, two boys, God can do it for you. Don't let the crisis make you forget about Bethel in the promise. Learn to manage the crisis and focus on the promise. Amen?